Millennia ago, before the advent of writing, humans roamed the earth. And at first, there was nothing to separate them from the animal world. That is, until they began to create tools. These early tools were made out of stone, giving rise to the Paleolithic Age, meaning Old Stone Age in Greek. During this period, early humans were hunter-gatherers. With repetition, they became better hunters and better foragers. There was no agriculture, and no domestication of animals. This simple life was dangerous, but it met their needs. They would forage for nuts, berries, and other plant life, while hunters stalked mammoths, bison, fish, and other sources of meat. This led to small societies of 20 to 30 people, and led to a nomadic lifestyle, migrating with the animals, and following seasonal plant growths. Hunting became a group effort, and those who worked together were more likely to survive. The tools they used were mainly for this activity. Spears and harpoons were widely used. Generally, men went on the hunt, leading to greater camaraderie in the face of a challenge, while women stayed near camp, foraging and taking care of the children. Neither role was viewed as inherently better. Apart from tools, the other factor that set humans apart was fire. After discovering fire, early humans could cook their food, making it easier to digest. Fire allowed them to brighten caves as well, and these became their shelters. They would also adorn some of these caves with art. Around 10 to 12,000 years ago, the last glacial period ended, allowing more of the globe to be inhabited. It was around this time that humans began to shift from food gathering and food hunting to food production. That transitioned into the Mesolithic Age, and then followed by the Neolithic Age, or New Stone Age. Stone tools became more polished during this period, but more importantly, the Neolithic became an agricultural revolution. Humans began planting seeds, tilling the land, and producing their own foods. They domesticated sheep, pigs, and cattle, and increased their food stores. By around 5000 BCE, many areas of the Old World had been practicing agriculture to some extent, but the majority still hunted and gathered. Those living in the Middle East had begun agriculture around 8000 BCE, and from there, farming techniques spread into southern and central Europe by 4000 BCE. The farming of wheat and barley also moved west to Egypt, and east to India. West Africa would use different agricultural techniques to yield yams. In southern China, the early Chinese produced rice, and in the north, millet. In the west, in Mesoamerica, the natives of the region, farmed beans, squash, and maize. What truly made this a revolution, was that farming allowed humans to remain sedentary through generations. This is what created the first Neolithic farming villages. The oldest were found in the Middle East. Jericho, near the Dead Sea in Palestine, was built by at least 8000 BCE, over 10,000 years ago. Chattel Hoyuk, in Turkey, wasn't as old, but was larger, at around 32 acres, and could have housed up to 6,000 inhabitants. Houses were mud brick, and fairly crammed together. Residents domesticated many different kinds of foods, from fruit, to different kinds of wheat, and were able to store it in special areas of their houses. The food surpluses led to a division of labor. More people could tend to other crafts, than food production. Some produced jewelry and other crafts. Some produced weapons. Religious statues have been found at this settlement, seemingly representing mothers or fertility. The sedentary lifestyle had long-lasting consequences for humans. The surplus of food, and ability to store it, led to exchange between different settlements. Sometimes food could be traded for crafts, created by the new artisan class. Pottery was important, as it could be used to cook, or store grain. Other tools were made to make gathering food easier, like blades to create sickles for use on the farms. Obsidian, a kind of volcanic glass, was used to make sharp blades. Flax and cotton were grown, and used to create types of cloth, used for clothing. 
men's relationship with women also shifted during the Neolithic. As men became the main food producers, working the farms and domesticating animals, they became more valued in society. Women did play their part as well though, grinding flour and making cheese from milk, as well as raising the children. Our sedentary existences today, and our stockpiling of food, is a direct result of the Neolithic Revolution. Prior to 4000 BCE, it's thought people of the Near East figured out a way to improve on their stone tools, and learn to liquefy, and then cool certain ores and elements, to create more durable metals. This gave way to a transitory stage called the Copper Age, and by around 3000 BCE, the beginning of the Bronze Age. Bronze was an alloy mixture of copper and tin, making it more durable. The start of the Bronze Age is generally where prehistory ends, and history begins. With more settlements being built, more stockpiling, and more artisans, wealth became kept within cities, making them targets. For protection, walls needed to be built, and communities banded together. These would eventually turn into the first civilizations. What makes a civilization? There is no set definition, but historians often take these next characteristics into consideration. A civilization should have cities, or urban centers. These are larger, more populated areas, used for political, religious, and economic affairs, larger than the villages of the Neolithic. Farmers in rural areas provided the food for the centralized governments located in these cities. Civilizations should also have an organized political structure or military. There was often a division of class. Kings, priests, or warriors were generally at the top, while artisans formed a middle class, often with farmers. The lowest class was usually the slaves. Religion was also a staple of civilization. The use of writing, especially to keep records, was also taken into account. Using these guidelines, scholars have identified six main areas of the world where civilization developed independently, all around rivers or major water sources. Located in the Old World, the oldest of these early civilizations are in Mesopotamia and Egypt. This land between the Tigris and Euphrates was called Mesopotamia by the later Greeks, meaning land between the rivers. In late spring, the rivers overflow, depositing silt on the soil, making it fertile, but the flooding is often chaotic and unpredictable. Early Mesopotamians grasped how to control the flooding with irrigation, making this land abundant in food. The first civilization to emerge here were the Sumerians. We know little of their origins, but by 3000 BCE, they were living in major urban centers in southern Mesopotamia, like Uruk, Ur, Ummah, and Lagash. Scholars have named this the early dynastic period. These cities were built with walls as a defense. With little stone or wood in the region, their structures were built with mud bricks, dried in the sun. Some of the most impressive buildings would be temples dedicated to their city's respective god or goddess. These temples were called ziggurats. The priests that ran these buildings often played a large role in governing. It was the king though, who truly had the power. This is because kingship was seen as divine in origin. Kings were used as the centralized power that oversaw the military and organized food production, including taming the rivers. High-ranked army generals and priests helped the king govern. Though the Sumerian economy was agricultural, it eventually began to rely on trade as well. They produced pottery, textiles, and metalworks for export, and imported copper and tin, to make bronze, and timber. The increased usage of the wheel, made trade with the nomads to the north easier. Society was separated into four distinct classes. Elites were at the top, and included the king, priest class, and their families. Under them were the dependent commoners, usually those employed to work in the palaces or ziggurats. Under those, free commoners were the farmers, artisans, merchants, and scribes. At the bottom, were the slaves. These slaves worked for the palace, the temples, and for rich landowners. Male slaves were used for building projects and farming, while females were used to make clothing. 
As the Sumerian city-states grew, there would eventually be conflict between them, often over water sources. Though the Sumerians fought amongst each other in southern Mesopotamia, just to the north were the Akkadians. They were a Semitic people, different from the Sumerians, but often mixed. Around 2340 BCE, one of these Akkadians, Sargon, led an army of over 5,000 down into Sumer and overran the city-states. This ended Sumer's early dynastic period and was the start of the Akkadian Empire under Sargon of Akkad. He and his descendants would rule until around 2200 BCE, when attacks by mountain barbarians dissolved the Akkadian Empire. This made it possible for the Sumerians to regain control of their region, and by 2112, under Ernamu, a new Sumerian Empire, called the Neo-Sumerian Empire, was founded and extended to the north. Once the capital city of Ur fell to outsiders in 2004 BCE, the city-states entered another state of conflict and instability. This would be the last time the Sumerians would hold power in Mesopotamia. By the 1800s BCE, a new empire would rise, ruled by another Semitic people, the semi-nomadic Amorites. Ruling from Babylon, Hammurabi conquered both the Sumerian and Akkadian regions, establishing what would be known as the Babylonian Empire. Taking a major role in governance, Hammurabi saw himself as a shepherd of his people, not their subjugator. He had defensive walls built for them, along with temples and irrigation networks. Increased trade also brought in wealth to his empire. The Code of Hammurabi was used as a law code and as a means to portray himself as righteous and just. Comprising just under 300 laws, the code gives us insight into the empire's views on justice. Social classes were highly respected, and crimes done by the lower classes against elites were punished more severely than vice versa. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, wasn't exactly literal. It simply meant that punishments should be equal to the crime committed, classes being equal of course. These retributive elements could have influenced law codes all over the Near East for centuries afterwards. Divorce was prohibited, but a man could divorce his wife if she was not able to bear children. If a man's wife was acting in a humiliating fashion, she could be prosecuted as well. Women were entitled to their husband's property once he died, and if a man divorced her without good reason, her family could be entitled to the return of their dowry. While husbands were allowed to pursue sexual relations outside of their marriage, a woman was not allowed to do so, and if she did, would be thrown into the nearest river to drown, along with the other adulterer. In cases of incest, a father could be banished if he was caught having relations with his daughter, while relations between a mother and son would see them both burned alive. As is evident, hierarchies were well respected and a major part of life in Mesopotamia. The priest class was revered because religion was such an important aspect of Mesopotamian life. The chaotic flooding of their rivers, along with the humidity and otherwise harsh climate, forced Mesopotamians to turn to the supernatural. They were polytheistic, believing in many different gods. The most important force in the world, god of the sky, Enlil, god of the wind, Enki, god of the earth and rivers, and Ninhursag, the mother goddess of the mountains and fertility. Mesopotamians believed these gods created them to do their manual labor for them, so viewed themselves as their servants. To figure out a god's desires, or plans, priests would practice divination. The most common form was sacrificing a goat or sheep, and then examining their organs. Priests and kings would attempt to predict military campaigns or the weather using divination. By far, Mesopotamia's greatest legacy though, was their writing system. Dating back to at least 3000 BCE, the Sumerians began using wedge-shaped impressions on clay tablets, which were then hardened in the sun. This writing system was called cuneiform. This system evolved from earlier pictograms. Cuneiform was used mainly for governmental records, and would be usually taught to males of the upper classes. Writing was important as it created new ways for people to communicate. The most famous piece of literature from Mesopotamia was the Epic of Gilgamesh, a story we only know of because it was written down. 
Gilgamesh was a semi-legendary king of the Sumerian city of Uruk. Along with his friend Enkidu, the pair go on an adventure together. Spoiler warning for the oldest story ever, but after Enkidu dies, Gilgamesh is overcome with the pain of loss, and searches for the secret to immortality. He meets Utnapishtim, a man the gods let live after the great flood, and then granted immortality. After trying to help Gilgamesh in his quest, the mighty king fails, and returns to Uruk disheartened. Immortality was to be a gift only for the gods. Apart from the arts, Mesopotamian sciences were also revolutionary. The Sumerians developed a number system based on 60, and used this to chart the stars. The lunar calendar was used to calculate dates. The Mesopotamians weren't the only ones in the Near East with civilization though. Slightly to the west, were the Egyptians. Just as Mesopotamia had its Tigris and Euphrates, Egypt, had the Nile. The river began in deep Africa, and flowed north into the Mediterranean. Each year, the Nile would flood, leaving silt deposits and enriching the soil. Egyptians would call this the Black Land, because of the fertile ground, in contrast with the Red Land, the barren Egyptian deserts. The river splits before emptying into the Mediterranean, forming more fertile areas called the Nile Delta. Corresponding to the way the Nile flows, this region was called Lower Egypt, while more upstream, and further south, was Upper Egypt. The miracle of the Nile was that it flooded regularly, and calmly, unlike the savage Mesopotamian rivers. Because of this, less administration was needed for these floods, meaning smaller rural cities, than their counterparts to the east. Another major difference was terrain. A major theme in Mesopotamia was constant invasion, resulting in instability, and a constant changing of power. Egypt, on the other hand, was well protected by natural boundaries. Deserts lay to the east and west, the Mediterranean to the north, and the Nile's cataphracts could be guarded to the south. This stability, mixed with the predictability of the Nile, is what caused Egyptian civilization to last for thousands of years. Historians lay out Egypt's history in three distinct periods, the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, times of prosperity and strength. Before the Old Kingdom though, Egypt was ruled by different tribal chieftains. By around 3100 BCE, a king named Nama would unify Upper and Lower Egypt into a single kingdom, gaining both the White and Red Crowns, and beginning Egypt's dynastic period. The Old Kingdom began around 2700 to 2575 BCE, with the Third or Fourth Dynasty. With its capital at Memphis, Egypt during the Old Kingdom period was a time of prosperity, constructing Egypt's longest-lasting legacy, the Pyramids. Egyptian kings would eventually take the name of Pharaoh in a later period, and were considered divine. Pharaohs were to rule by the principle of Mart, a universal harmony and order of the universe. The Egyptian bureaucracy eventually grew, and was governed by the king's vizier. To better administer Egypt, the land was divided up into provinces, later called gnomes by the Greeks. Each gnome was appointed a governor, called a nomarch. Over time, these nomarchs gained too much power, leading to the end of the Old Kingdom, and a decentralized intermediate period by 2150. By 2055, a new dynasty managed to take back power, ushering in the Middle Kingdom period, Egypt's second golden age. This period had a more centralized government, with nomarchs having to provide more duties for the king. The title of pharaoh went from a title of divinity, to that of a shepherd leading its people. The pharaoh was still at the very top of all the social classes in both the Old and Middle Kingdoms. Below the pharaoh was the upper class of nobles and priests. They were responsible for rituals involving the king, and with managing the wealth. Below them were artisans and merchants. They would trade with other cultures, including Mesopotamia, and travel down the Nile to other villages. Trade was open between Crete, Nubia, and the land of Punt. Egyptian artisans were some of the best in the world, and offered a wide variety of goods. Below them were the farmers, the majority of workers. As the pharaoh and his nobles owned the land, those who worked the fields were serfs, and had to pay a portion of their yields to the king. 
they also could be called for military service or as workers for building projects. As religion was inextricably linked with Egyptian life, rituals were performed daily by the priest class, supervised by the pharaoh. The most prominent natural wonder in ancient Egypt was the sun, so the sun god, Ra, became the most powerful of all gods. Other prominent gods were Osiris, Isis, and their son Horus. An Egyptian myth tells of Osiris being killed by his brother Seth, and his body cut up into pieces and thrown across the earth. But Isis found his pieces and restored him to life. He became a god of the underworld and of resurrection. Pharaohs, with the process of embalming and mummification in tombs, could hope to become reborn, just like Osiris. The tombs, though symbols of death, survived for centuries. Built during the Old Kingdom, the pyramid stood at the center of other tombs and mastabas, reserved for family and servants. Pharaoh's tombs were adorned like a regular room, with chairs, weapons, games, and food. This is because they believed that if they preserved the physical body properly, through embalming and mummification, a pharaoh's car, or spiritual body, would still go on living, and be able to enjoy these pleasures. The mummification process itself, preserved the body by drying it out. The brain was pulled out by the nose, and internal organs extracted with small incisions. Next, the corpse was covered in salt to absorb the moisture. Later, the body was filled with spices, and wrapped up with linen soaked in resin. A mask was then placed on this mummy, which was then sealed in a case. This process took around 70 days to complete. It was then placed in its tomb, or pyramid. The largest of these was the Great Pyramid, or the Pyramid of Giza, built by Khufu near the beginning of the Old Kingdom period. This pyramid was the largest ever built, with a 756-foot base, and height of 481 meters. For millennia, the Great Pyramid could be seen from miles away, leaving its mark as an ancient Egyptian icon, and the only surviving of the seven wonders of the world. Egyptians had other artistic talents as well. Pharaohs and their nobles would commission art, like statues and paintings, for their palaces and temples. Writing also developed independently of the Sumerians, although slightly later. The Greeks would later call this writing system hieroglyphics, meaning priest writings, or sacred writings. These weren't a true alphabet, but signs which depicted objects. Originally carved into stone, different scripts would develop from these, and would be written on papyrus, a paper made from Egyptian reeds. Spoken Egyptian was related to the Semitic language, both a branch of the Afroasiatic language family. The Middle Kingdom would last until around 1650 BCE, when Egypt was invaded by a West Asian Semitic people they would call the Hyksos. Using bronze weapons and two-wheeled chariots, the Hyksos were able to successfully invade Lower Egypt, fragmenting authority and bringing in the Second Intermediate Period. This would only last for around 100 years. The Egyptians learned to make these same bronze weapons and chariots during the occupation, and used these same devices to expel the Hyksos by 1550 BCE, and establish the 18th dynasty, and the new kingdom of Egypt, a third golden age. With their military advancements, Egypt became more aggressive and less insular, forging an empire that became the most powerful in the Near East. They were a wealthy empire, and had extravagant palaces built, like under Hatshepsut. This was one of the first female pharaohs, and was often referred to as king, and depicted with a beard. Her nephew, Tutmosis III, led several campaigns up into the Levant and Syria and expanded west into Libya. The 18th dynasty continued on, and ran into some self-inflicted trouble with Pharaoh Amenhope IV. He changed his name to Akhenaten, meaning servant of Aten, the supreme god. Temples were closed, and the priests of Armenra lost their power. Religious power was centered in Thebes, but Akhenaten then created another capital at Amarna. Akhenaten's attempts at monotheism weren't taken very well by the traditional polytheistic Egyptians. They saw it not only as disrespectful, but dangerous. The pharaoh's obsession with these changes also caused the empire to lose its holdings in Syria and the Levant. 
Akhenaten's successor, the boy Tutankhaten, changed his name to Tutankhamun, rejecting Aten, and restored the old gods. Under the 19th dynasty, Egypt went on to reclaim its status as an imperial power. Ramses is often regarded as the new kingdom's greatest pharaoh. During the Late Bronze Age collapse, around 1200 BCE, Egypt was invaded by the mysterious Sea Peoples, and were a weakened shell of their once great power. Much of the East Mediterranean and Middle East was affected. Egypt would then enter a period of decline, and by 1069 BCE, would fragment once again, into a third intermediate period, falling into the hands of the Libyans, Nubians, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans, and seldom to be ruled by native Egyptians. Daily life in Egypt was quite traditional. Marrying young and starting a family was promoted, although men could marry additional wives, if the original couldn't have children, or refused to. The father was usually head of the household, but wives were respected as wise women, and trusted to educate the youngsters. The pharaoh himself, had a queen, known as the great wife, but could have his pick of other women as he pleased. Generally, women were barred from public office, and other high-ranking career paths, but they had property and inheritance rights. Poorer women, often had to work the fields. Rich ones, often became priestesses. Adultery, as in Mesopotamia, was forbidden, with harsh penalties mainly for women, like being burned at the stake, or having her nose removed. Divorces were allowed though, and often dealt with fairly. There is evidence that Egyptian influence spread all over the Mediterranean. But it also reached further south. This is Nubia, present-day Sudan. This civilization could have emerged around the same time as Old Kingdom Egypt, or even earlier. The Nubians and Egyptians shared their culture through trade for centuries. By the time New Kingdom Egypt began to decline, Nubia was gaining power, and established the Kingdom of Kush. By the 8th century BCE, Kush had expanded and taken control of Egypt, establishing the 25th dynasty. They ruled for almost 100 years, but were eventually expelled by the Assyrians. After the discovery of iron further to the south, the Nubians moved their capital to Meroe. They truly flourished here through trade, and built magnificent areas filled with pyramids, more than Egypt ever built. While Mesopotamia and Egypt were the foremost civilizations of the Bronze Age, Europe was making strides as well. They too, developed agriculture by at least 6500 BCE, and domesticated animals even longer. Early Europeans would build large stone structures, what the later Greeks called megaliths. These were thought to be used for astronomical observations, like the solstices, but also tracking moon movements and phases. Apart from the dominance of the Afroasiatic language family in the Near East, with Semitic and Egyptian, another language group developed, this time around the Pontic steppe. These were the Indo-Europeans. Their language would spread as they migrated all across Europe, branching into Greek, Italic and eventually Latin, Germanic, Slavic, and into Asia, branching into Persian and Sanskrit. Their use of the horse and wheel, allowed them a rapid expansion all across Eurasia. Sticking with the Near East, one of the most prominent groups were the Hittites. By 1750 BCE, they emerged in Turkey, absorbing the natives, and establishing their Hittite kingdom, with their capital at Hattusa. By 1600, they had their own empire, becoming rivals with New Kingdom Egypt. They got their hands on iron weapons early, still during the Bronze Age, which was a better alternative to bronze, which needed both copper and tin to create. The Hittites adopted much of the Mesopotamian culture and might have been responsible for introducing it to neighboring regions in Europe. Internal struggles plagued the Hittites, and they became weak enough that they couldn't survive the invasions of the Late Bronze Age. Egypt was weakened and went into slow decline, but the Hittite Empire crumbled. In between both Egypt and the Hittites, was the Levant. Now that neither was a presence in the area, new city-states and kingdoms were able to emerge in the power vacuum. In present-day Lebanon, were the Phoenicians. They were another Semitic people, residing in their three main cities of Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre. 
Because of their geography, the Phoenicians always looked outwards towards the sea, and became a maritime trading power. Their most famous exports were the timber from their cedar trees, and their famous purple dyes, called murex. The name Phoenician was given to them by the Greeks as it derives from the color purple or red. They became expert seafarers, traveling west past the Mediterranean, reaching western Africa, and north to Britain. The Phoenicians established colonies in the West Mediterranean, like on the island of Sicily, and Spain. Their most famous, would be their North African colony of Carthage. Unlike the Egyptians or Mesopotamians, the Phoenicians developed a phonetic alphabet, consisting of 22 letters. They could be used interchangeably to write out different words in their language. This alphabet would later be passed down to the Greeks, and then eventually the Romans, which we derived and still use today. Phoenicia was never a kingdom, but a group of independent cities. They would remain independent for a few hundred years, before they were taken over by the Assyrians, which we will see later in this video. Just to the south of where the Phoenicians lived, were the Hebrews. They were another Semitic people, but were more nomadic. In truth, they were a minor group of tribes, and there would have been nothing truly remarkable about them, if not for their religious legacy. The Hebrews viewed themselves as descendants of Abraham, a man who fled the city of Ur, during the Neo-Sumerian period, and settled with his family and people in the land of Canaan. According to the Hebrew tradition, a drought caused Abraham's descendants to migrate further south, living in peace until they were enslaved by the Egyptians. Used in numerous building projects, the Hebrews wouldn't be saved until Moses led his people out of Egypt, and the tribe spent 40 years returning to Canaan. Back in the Levant, they would become locked in conflict with the Philistines, a people who had migrated over, perhaps from Europe, as part of the invasions of the Bronze Age collapse, around 1200 BCE. They could have been related to the Sea Peoples who weakened Egypt. Just like the Phoenicians, the Hebrews would now be able to truly flourish, as the Near East was still reeling. Again evidence is sparse, but according to the Hebrew tradition, Saul established a kingdom of Israel around 1050 BCE, whose unity helped in the struggle with the Philistines. After his death, David, one of Saul's men, became king. Under David, the Israelites conquered the Philistines, establishing themselves as rulers of Canaan, making the capital of his kingdom at Jerusalem. After King David, Solomon became king. Israel reached a high point under his reign. He opened up trade, and tradition holds him responsible for the building of the first temple of Jerusalem. Tensions began to rise between the Hebrew tribes of the north and south, and after Solomon's death, the United Kingdom would split into two different kingdoms. The Kingdom of Israel consisted of the ten northern tribes, and had a capital at Samaria. The Kingdom of Judah, in the south, consisted of two Hebrew tribes, keeping the capital of Jerusalem. During the late 700s BCE, the Assyrians continued their expansion of the Near East, and invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. Samaria was ransacked, and the ten tribes were dispersed, and sent to other parts of the Assyrian Empire. There, they would assimilate, and eventually lose their identities. Today, they are known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah was able to keep its independence, but became a tributary state to the Assyrians. All this changed though, once the new Babylonian Empire defeated the Assyrians, and inherited their territory. After a revolt, the Babylonians invaded Judah, and destroyed most of Jerusalem by 586 BCE. They then deported the Hebrews living there, sending them to Babylon as captives. This Babylonian Empire didn't last for long, and by the mid-500s BCE, the Persians, under Cyrus, defeated the Babylonians, and released the Hebrews, ending the Babylonian captivity. They returned to Judah, and rebuilt their city and temple. They would eventually be called Jews, after their land of Judah. It is thought that before the exile, the Hebrews worshipped a supreme god, but also believed other gods existed, like that of the moon or trees. It was only during the Babylonian captivity, that their monotheism became more firmly established in Jewish minds. This is where they wrote down a lot of their beliefs. 
the most central of these beliefs was the covenant. This was an agreement made between the Hebrews and their God, that the Lord would protect his people, if they followed his laws. The laws were sets of moral and ethical rules, the most famous being the Ten Commandments. These laws were often taught and encouraged by the prophets. These prophets were religious teachers, said to be the voice of God. They would warn of great danger if people broke the sacred covenant. The Jewish experience in ancient times strengthened their faith and over the next centuries would often put them at odds with their rulers. The Phoenicians and Hebrews were only two small regions on the Levant. Back in Mesopotamia, larger empires would emerge. The Assyrians had resided in northern Mesopotamia for centuries, while Babylonia was in the south, but with the use of iron weapons, the Assyrians went on a campaign of expansion, and by 700 BCE, conquered Mesopotamia, the Levant, and parts of Egypt, Anatolia, and the Iranian Plateau. This Neo-Assyrian Empire would be the biggest ever assembled so far in history, but this could have left it overextended. Revolts were quite common, and once their great king, Ashurbanipal, died, Babylon revolted, and forged an alliance with the Medes, a conquered Iranian people. Both Babylon and the Medes then marched on the Assyrian capital, and Nineveh fell in 612 BCE, with the empire crumbling soon after. At its height, the Assyrian Empire was large, but built an impressive communication system, using horses and donkeys, to send messages all over the empire, with only a week delay. The Assyrian army was responsible for most of its success. They were mainly a militaristic empire, with a fearsome standing army consisting mainly of infantry. Assyrians practiced using war chariots and constructed some of the best siege equipment in the Near East. Their most potent weapon though, was their ruthlessness. They were known for cutting down fruit trees, and setting farms on fire, and destroying landscapes. Captives who revolted were treated even worse, and either mutilated, or set aflame. They had a policy of deportation, which created a multicultural empire. Assyrian kings were viewed as their god, Asher's representative on earth. Assyria itself was named after this god. It became wealthy as the crossroads of trade in the Near East. But as they excelled being a military and economically powerful empire, Assyria wasn't the bedrock of culture or civilization, like Babylonia to its south. Most of Assyrian culture was taken from the Babylonians and Sumerians that preceded them. Assyrian kings would see themselves as preservers of those Mesopotamian traditions. The Royal Library of Ashurbanipal was a collection of over 30,000 clay tablets, an assemblage of texts from all over Mesopotamia and beyond. Included among its tablets was the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Assyria was known for its art reliefs as well. Realistic scenes of war were portrayed in stone, and the king would be portrayed as a strong figure. After the Assyrian Empire fell to Babylon, Mesopotamian dominance fell back towards the south. This Neo-Babylonian Empire was ruled by a Chaldean dynasty, another Semitic people, either from Arabia or the Persian Gulf. The most famous of these Babylonian kings was Nebuchadnezzar II, who made Babylon the leading city in all of the Near East once again. This new empire would last less than 100 years, and in 539 BCE, was conquered by the Persians. The Persians, like the Hittites, were an Indo-European people, and lived on the Iranian plateau. They were groups of nomadic tribes, but were unified by the Achaemenid dynasty. This dynasty managed to conquer the Medes in Iran, and under Cyrus the Great, expand west, conquering the kingdom of Lydia in Anatolia, and marched further to seize the Greek city-states, that had been on the coast in Ionia. After campaigns in the east of Iran, and a bit of the Indian subcontinent, he marched on Babylon and captured it in 539 BCE, seizing the Neo-Babylonian territories as well. He made these regions into different provinces, which were called satrapies, and run by governors, or satraps. Cyrus portrayed himself as part of the Babylonian lineage, and was greeted as a liberator. He ended the Babylonian captivity, freeing the Jews to return to Jerusalem where they rebuilt their temple, leading him to be viewed as the anointed king, or messiah. 
Unlike the Assyrians, Cyrus was a kind and tolerant ruler, and his subjects, from the Medes, to Babylonians, to the Jews, viewed him as legitimate. After Cyrus died, his son Cambyses invaded Egypt, and added the land of the pharaohs to the empire. Next, King Darius expanded further into India to the Indus, and his generals conquered Thrace, and made Macedon a tribute state. In 499 BCE, with aid from Athens, the Greek cities on the Ionian coast revolted, and ended up burning the Persian city of Sardis in Lydia. After subduing the cities, Darius then sent an army to invade Greece itself as punishment, but the Persian army was defeated by the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon, in 490 BCE. By this time though, the Persian Empire was the biggest the world had ever seen. It spanned from Thrace, down past the Levant, to Egypt, across Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Iran, and western India, and divided into around 20 satrapies. For communication across this massive empire, the Persians built a series of roads. The main one was called the Royal Road. The king himself was never considered divine, but as the chosen of the Persian god, Ahura Mazda. Unlike the pharaohs, the Achaemenid kings kept to themselves, spending their time at remote palaces. After Cyrus, Persian kings became less benevolent, spiking taxes and amassing wealth for themselves. Apart from their palatial splendors, they spent this money on an elite military. The Persian army called upon warriors from all parts of its empire, from Egypt to India, but their most iconic units were Iranian-born infantry. Always numbering 10,000, they would be called the Immortals, as when one was killed, he was immediately replaced. The Persian religion was also quite unique. It was called Zoroastrianism, after its founder, Zoroaster. According to the Persians, Zoroaster was born in the 7th century BCE, and experienced visions and revelations that led him to the one true religion. His teachings were eventually written down in the Zend of Esther, in the 200s BCE. Most likely predating the Jewish shift to monotheism in Babylon, Zoroaster believed there to be only one supreme god, Ahura Mazda, which means wise lord. He was the creator of all things, and the embodiment of justice and goodness. But just as he was righteous, Ahura Mazda was opposed by his counter, an evil spirit named Ahriman, lord of chaos and darkness. Zoroaster preached that humans had free will, and needed to perform good deeds because at the last judgment, human souls that were good would be separated from those that were bad, and sent either to paradise, or the abyss. This is where a lot of the dualistic nature of good versus evil, heaven and hell, and a final judgment comes from. This would later influence Christianity.